Journey IFC strives to create safe spaces to worship God. Know that you are welcome just as you are, regardless of religious background or lack thereof, skin color, political affiliation, sexuality, age, culture, or any other label you own or society throws on you. You are welcomed and celebrated here just as you are. Our reading today comes from the book of Ruth, and we will focus on the story of three women, Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. <coughs> When they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard <coughs> in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security each of you in the house of your husband. And then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. That's a good mother-in-law relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb, that they may become your husbands? Turn back. My daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait till they were grown? Would you refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So today our story comes from the book of Ruth, which I said is one of the shortest books in the Bible. It's like a, you can sit down and read in one sitting, and I love those because I'm not a big reader. Um, and it's like four pages, so it's like really short. Uh, but although it's really short, it's meaty. There's like a lot you can dig into. The language is really interesting and cool. I, and we're going to do some of that today. I'm going to get to nerd out a little bit in my Hebrew, um, so I'm excited for that. Um, but it's also an interesting story because it doesn't talk much about God. God's kind of mentioned, but God doesn't 
like engage in any clear way. They don't really talk a lot about God. There's just kind of this agreement that your God will be my God. There's not a lot of that, so I like that. There's not dense theology. It's just this kind of simple story uh, that is really relatable. In fact, when I read it, I can see people in Journey that I'm like, oh, that's that character. Oh, that's that character. And I think y'all will probably identify with him. And in a bit, we'll do an activity where we'll, we'll try to identify with all of your characters in one way or another. But this story, it opens up and it, and it puts us right in a time period. It really gives us a lot of context. And so it's, it says, it's in the days of the judges. Um, and this is important because um, at this point, Israel is being ruled by judges um, who are kind of leaders that would come up and fall away pretty fast. It wasn't very centralized. All of this is kind of propaganda to be like, we need kings. And then the kings come and they screw it up. But this is kind of that in-between period of the judges aren't working and we need a king or some kingship. That's what they think is going to solve the issue. And so right now there's a famine. And so probably because there's judges and there's not the centralized government. And so people are kind of freaking out trying to find food. And we're taken to the town of Bethlehem um, to a man named Elimelech who was married to a woman named Naomi, who are, you know, she's one of our main characters here. And they have two sons named Malan and Chilion, which are really weird names when we get to that. And they have fled to Moab due to this famine. And when we hear Moab, this should be an important note for us. This is a place that has some really tense history between the Hebrew people. Um, so the Moabites, there's this like long history back to Lot and his daughters and this weird sexual sin stuff and incest and it's probably propaganda as well to be like, the Moabites are bad people, they were nearby neighbors, and so there's a lot of tension. Uh, but when people heard Moab, they went to Moab, they'd be like, you left Judah to go to Moab? That went, that's crazy. And so we should have that in the back of our minds that they've gone to a place that is deemed bad or othered or, you know, the evil ones. And so they flee um, away and they, they find refuge here in this place and they find food because the place that they were at called Bethlehem, didn't have food anymore. And it's interesting at this point because the Hebrew names here give us a lot of context as well. Um, and one of the cool things about Hebrew is that when a name is put out or when words are put out in the, the Hebrew Bible, uh, they, they always come true. They're gonna come all the way back around in some way or another. Um, so if someone's name is a certain thing or a place's name is a certain thing, that is gonna become true in some way. So it gives us some foreshadowing into what's gonna happen. And so it's interesting, they, fl they flee Bethlehem, and this word Bethlehem means the house of bread. And so the house of bread has a famine. They don't have any bread in the house of bread. And so they flee, and they go to Moab, which is this you know, bad region. But don't worry, one of the characters, Elimelech, his name means my God is king, which is a very noble name. That's like probably going to be a faithful dude. I don't know, he's just the, the typical patriarch in the story, and he has a very patriarchal name, and he's married to Naomi, and her name means pleasantness. And so we're like, oh, this is going to be a really good story, right? Hold on, they have sons, and their names are Maitland, which means sickness, oh and Chilean, meaning destruction. <laughs> so, if, if you were to name your kids honestly, what would you name them? Right? <laughs> And so their names, their mainland sickness, children, destruction, and this all clues us into some key parts in the beginning of this story that they're going to go from pleasantness to sickness and destruction. And so they leave for this foreign region during a famine and things just continue to unravel. It goes from pleasantness to sickness. And so Elimelech eventually dies um, as they get to this new foreign land and Naomi is now a single mother, and she's stranded here in Moab with her two sons. Um, and this is all in a culture that saw women as merely property at that time. And so she had no rights herself. She was just the mother, mother and a widow, and her worth was all bound up in that. And so now she has to figure out how to make a way for her and her two sons. And so it, we're told that the two sons, you know, sickness and destruction are their names. They take Moabite wives. So this means that they are now kind of acculturating. They're, they're getting into the, the people there. They're also intermarrying, which this was kind of a no-no at the time. Um, and anyone who was reading this text when it was written probably would be like, oh, this is not good. In fact, Ezra and Nehemiah are like, like later on are like, you can't do this. This is bad. But Ruth solidifies that, no, there is space for intermarriage, and this is okay. So they marry outside of their people, and this is frowned upon. And um, 
Um, and they take these foreign wives, even though they are the foreigners in this case, and they are married for about 10 years. And we don't know what their marriage is like. It, really, it's just they're married, and then 10 years later, they die. And so um, tragedy keeps falling them again. The sons die, and Naomi is now left with two daughter-in-laws and all this responsibility. Um, and the two daughters are named Orpah and Ruth. And so Naomi, Naomi at this point has to make some moves, right? She has to figure out how she can survive while also caring for her two in-laws that are now in her sole care. She's responsible for these two women as well. And Naomi at this point has heard that there was the famine in Bethlehem, that that is over, you know, the house of bread as we talked about. And she's like, I'm going to go back to the house of bread so that we can get some bread and we can have this chance at survival. And so now Naomi has to return to this migratory status that she was in many years ago. You know, years ago when her and her husband and her, and her two sons had to make this scary trek in the middle of a famine, hungry, to a place they didn't know, and then her, her husband dies, and then her sons die, and so she's alone, and now she has to make this trek back to her former homeland. But this time she has Orpah and Ruth with her. And so as they begin their journey back to Naomi's former home, and, and they, they leave Orpah and Ruth's current home, Naomi, Naomi stops them. And she speaks candidly. She has this really cool speech that she gives them, and, and she's really feeling the weight of what is happening. It hits her in this moment. And she tells them that, you know, your future is not guaranteed if you're with me, right? Even going to Bethlehem, if they have food, it's not a guarantee that we will be received well because we're now Moabite women. You are Moabite women. You are the enemy of the Hebrew people. And now they probably see me as that. They think I've left them and betrayed them. How will we be received as these widows, as these burdens on society in some way or another? And so Naomi tells these two women to return to their mother's house which I love that on Mother's Day that they are told to return by their mother-in-law to their mother's house. We don't hear about a father in this scenario. We don't know if he's in the picture. Maybe he's dead. Maybe that's why, you know, Orpah and Ruth had to marry, you know, these foreigners or well. Maybe there was something at stake for them too. But Naomi gives them the chance to return home. When she does, does this, she offers this blessing that, that God will deal with them as lovingly as they have dealt with both their dead husbands and with Naomi. Because Naomi wants them to be okay, and to be safe, and, and to have this good life, and, and she wants them to be secure, but Naomi knows that she cannot offer them that kind of peace. And so these three women, in their grief, having lost so much already their husbands, their life that they knew for ten years or longer, they stand together, they hug each other, and they weep aloud. As Natalie said, that's a good mother-in-law relationship. And I love that, that they don't say any words, they just begin with the weeping, which shows how close they were, I think. And so Naomi and Ruth push back a bit on this, and they say, no, we will go with you, we'll return with you. But Naomi reminds them that she has nothing else to give them. She has nothing right now. They, she can't give them a husband, even years down the line, even if she gave birth right now, she couldn't do that. She can't give them a future, she can't give them money, she can't even give them food right now. And so Orpah takes this and she understands what Naomi has told her and she heeds her advice and she decides to return home to her mother, to her people, to her faith, her God. And then some extra biblical stuff, this isn't in the Bible, they take Orpah and they kind of write her off as the, the villain here because she didn't stay. But I, I don't see that. I, that's, that's added to the text. I think she makes the decision to go home. Instead, I see Orpah as this woman who has offered a choice and chose the path that would lead to what she saw as happiness and her best chance at surviving, even if that meant saying goodbye to the people she loved, her sister, her mother-in-law, who she cared deeply for. <clears throat> it meant that she had to, to say goodbye to a life she had known for 10 years, 10 years of marriage when this happens. And now she has to go face the world alone as a widow, which is a terrifying thing in this culture, for the first time. So she leaves behind the comfort of Naomi and Ruth and goes out as Orpah on her own. But I think it was a courageous move in one, in one sense. I think she was willing to do the hard work and fight for her own way. 
But Ruth doesn't follow Orpah's lead. Instead, she, she says she clings to Naomi. I love that, the, the clinging to her. And then she gives this beautiful speech, which you probably have heard at many weddings. It's often used at weddings. And it's what we read here, that where you go, I will go. Where, like, where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. I will be buried there. It's these beautiful words spoken by Ruth to Naomi that, that give us some sense of hope of a future. And it's no surprise that Ruth's name actually means friend. Um, and so I could have told you that over, and probably would have run the ending of the story, but her name means friend, and that's what she has become for Naomi. She's, she's crossed over this daughter-in-law vibe to this life companion. And it's this beautiful switch, but it's weird that we use this at weddings because this is not about two people getting married. It's completely different. And as I was talking with my mom yesterday about this, she reminded me that this was actually the scripture verse used at her wedding with my dad. Um, and in fact, my dad's wedding ring has Ruth, whatever, one, one ten, or eight um, listed in, in his ring. And I thought that was a really cool thing, but my mom joked that it's kind of a weird one, looking back at the context, to be our wedding one. And she said that, you know, when I made those vows with her dad, I actually was probably making them with, you know, Mutter, who's my grandma, who's my mother-in-law. Sammy is her actual name, but we call her Mutter. And I just thought it was funny that my mom was like, I think I made a vow to my mother-in-law. <laughs> How romantic, right? But I think these words are beautiful. It makes sense that we, we use them in weddings because it's such a proclamation of love. These women who are forced into migration and who are facing hunger cling to each other because they have nothing else left. It reminds us of the great love needed to do life with another person. And I, and I don't mean just in a marriage, in a spouse kind of relationship. I think this happens in friendships and, or with our in-laws or with any other platonic friendship that we have, any relationship like that. All of that takes this kind of love, this kind of work to, to make it last. And so one of my favorite things about the story is that it's so relatable in a sense. There's, there's no heroes, really, like not major heroes in this. There's not really any villains. You kind of have to add that. Everyone's painted in kind of a favorable light. It, it's kind of a simple story that seems like we could be plugged into or know people that are plugged into the story facing this right now. I also love this story because it, it doesn't focus on the need to be a wife or to be a mother, those pressures are there in the society. And those are pressures, I think, in our society now. And these are things that are typically unexpectedly thrust upon women. You need to be a wife, you need to be a mother. And while that seems like a foreign, ancient thing, that is still something that people are facing today, especially on Mother's Day, when we celebrate moms and wives and all of that. And I think that kind of pressure is some crap. Like we talked about last week with Eve, there's a lot of crap there. But I think this story reminds us that but these women can be something beyond just a wife and a mother. That, that even if they're widowed and they're these, you know, illegal aliens or the, these migrants, these immigrants, whatever we want to call them, that they still have a place in our story. And although I would love to read all four pages of this short little story to you, I'm going to save some time by summing up the rest. So Ruth and Naomi, they, they go back to the house of bread, Bethlehem, and they're forced to get food from what is left behind. And so people in this time, the farmers, they'd go out and get the barley, the wheat, and they'd you know, cut it down and collect it. And whatever fell to the ground, they'd leave it so anyone else could come up and get it. And this was a, a typical practice in the time. It was a way that they could care for the, the lesser, the weaker, the, the widows, the orphans. Those people could come up and get something. And so Naomi sends Ruth to do this so they can have food. And Ruth, a very hard worker who is willing to leave her home and travel all this distance to Bethlehem, is going out day after day collecting food for her and Naomi, just anything that was left behind. So one day she's doing this and she gets to this field who's, that's owned by a man named Boaz, um, and they have this interaction. And, and it's interesting, his name means strength. I wanted to point that out. Um, because he's probably this strong farmer guy. He's in, in charge of this land, and he has all of these workers, and for some reason he is captivated, captivated by Ruth. And, and we don't know why. It's maybe her love for Naomi. It's maybe how hardworking she is. But he stops and talks to her, and then he tells his workers to leave behind some of the good stuff. He's like, hey, pick some stuff and then leave it behind so she can get that. 
And so the workers listen to them and they do that, and they end up with all of this food so that they have enough to eat for like many days. It's like, it even gives you an amount, I don't even know how much it is. It's a lot of food. It's a lot of food that's gonna get them through. They've survived, they've made it, and this is that sign of that. So when Ruth comes back to Naomi and tells her about Boaz, this strong strength guy, man, Naomi informs Ruth that Boaz is what was called in this time a kinsman redeemer. And so this was a family member of the deceased husband who, who could step into the marriage. They could marry this widow. Um, and this is a way that fulfilled the law and it helped with land and relationships and all of that. And that was kind of the next step is if you lost your husband and you're kind of married off to his brother, cousin, whatever. But Boaz is in this line. And so Naomi is like, yes, this is great. We can jump on this. And so although this story is empowering in some ways, we have to remember that it was still in a patriarchal society. So there's some there's trouble things. She has to get married. That, that happens. But at least he's a really nice guy. Right? You know, at least he's nice. At least he's strong, I guess. I don't know. And it makes me wonder, they're like, oh, we're helpless without a husband. But really, they've made it a long way without any help of a man so far. They've been, they've been hanging in there. And so Naomi encourages Ruth to, to go seek out Boaz. And, and then they perform this weird ritual thing on the threshing floor, which has a sexual nature. And I wish I could talk about it, but that's a talk for another day. Because it's too juicy to, to get into all of that. But, but Ruth goes and she is with Boaz, and, and he's willing to marry her, and it's a strange kind of dance that they do, and, and then he goes out to the, the city gate and performs the legal actions so that he can take her on as a wife. So then if we fast forward even more to the story, they, they get married, and then Ruth eventually has a child, and she names him Obed, which means servant of God. So the conclusion of this short story ends with Naomi, who was a, a widowed woman who lost her two sons, holding her grandchild in, in her arms on her chest. And it's, it's this beautiful take, going from, from tragedy to ending with hope and this future to come. When the future does come, we're actually given kind of the genealogy, and we're told that Ruth had Obed, and, and Obed had a kid named Jesse, and, and Jesse had a kid named David, who would one day become the king of Israel. So a story that was rooted in affairs with foreign people from a warring region, a, a story of inter-religious marriage and death and sickness and destruction somehow brings forth life and, and, and leads Jerusalem and, and, and Israel into a new era, from, from judges into kingship, where eventually King David would rise to power and would take the throne. So that makes Ruth, this friend of Naomi, this widow outsider, this unexpected hero of our story, and makes her the great-grandmother of King David. And if we follow that genealogy, and we keep going with it as the Bible loves to do, they love genealogies, and we keep going further and further, Ruth, Ruth ends up appearing in Jesus' genealogy as well. So Ruth, this woman, this outsider, nobody who could have returned home and her story would have ended there, becomes the ancestor of King David and Jesus. And she has this legacy of her own. And so I think it's a wonderful story to read on Mother's Day because it's a day when many people are struggling with their own thoughts on mothers. And so it kind of lifts up all the struggling stuff with that. That some people today are grieving the loss of their mothers or they're holding their, their memories of their mom, mothers fondly in their hearts. And it's a day when some people struggle with it because they're widowed or they've lost a child or they were forced into a role society thought was necessary to matter, to have any worth. It's a day when we celebrate the many mothers who came before and brought forth life and hope in a new way, despite all of the odds being stacked against them. In their case, they had famine and death after death, and they still found a way. Today is a day when we can celebrate people like Orpah and Naomi and Ruth, three women who all had to find a way of their own. Three women who braved the unknown circumstances and did what they thought was best for their future. Three women who just learned how to be in their own story. Three women who were so courageous that, that their story is something we still read to this day. That it made it into the Bible. This four-page book was important enough. We need them to know that much about Ruth that we even named the book after her and read it to this day. 
And so may we, this day and this week, may we too find a way. May we be empowered by these stories to follow our own journeys wherever they lead us. And may God place people like these three women, Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth, in our lives that can give us courage and keep us going. Well, on this day that we call Mother's Day, mother really doesn't have a gender. A mother is where you find them. A mother is where you find people you nurture. That's what really being a mother means. So in this week, be aware that you do nurture one another even if you're not aware of it. So keep in mind this week that nurturing is the root of all life and of all pleasure and of all knowledge and of all spirituality. And in that, everyone is a mother. Go in peace. Amen.